Uh, okay. I think it's very important, as I mentioned, to understand what the market, the European, how the European market could perform in the in the coming years. And let me focus focus uh, on on the vision of the company like. Okay. okay, let's continue. Let me focus on, 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 on the vision of a company like FEPSA and how we have adapted at any time our strategy to this changing and volatile market. But let's review the history. Uh, I think it's important to understand where we are today to, to, to reveal what uh, has happened uh, since the beginning. And I've used, I've used, uh, oh, yeah, you, you could see this uh, scheme. I've prepared some slides that are based in this TV series of the 80s called El Una Vez El Nombre. Since probably most of you are very young, <laughs> you do not even have seen it, uh, probably. Mm, uh, you could see that the, the commercialization of natural gas in Spain as a liberalized uh, activity, as an open market, is very recent. And precisely, working in such non-mature and growing market, it what makes it so fascinating. My main intention, my main goal with this business case is to transmit you enthusiasm an incredible wish to work in this industry and to learn every day a bit more. And why not, probably, why not to work with us, with PEPSA, in a market with a huge potential and that will be for sure one of the pillars of SEPSA business in the future. Let me say that one of, the, of our main goals in SEPSA is to attract and retain talent. Going back to the first stages, since the beginning, CEPSA was precisely the first retailer in natural gas commercialization. We signed the first third-party access contract with Edagas and with Gas Natural Distribution. I mean, we don't own neither the reacidification plants nor the transportation network we need to book capacity. And we signed the first third-party access contract out of the monopoly. Only few, only few. It was, uh, it was uh, signed with Nagas in December '99. So I mean that, and this was the initial, the, the beginning of this uh, commercialization activity. It means only 16 uh, years ago. Only a few weeks after this uh, contract, we imported the first LNG cargo out of the monopoly. I remember it was a vessel called Hasier Mel, size uh, 35,000 cubic meters. So it's a small vessel. It, it was a very small vessel. Since then, we have seen how the size of the vessel has grown. And the normal range right now is between 135,000 cubic meters and 160,000. But there are even some vessels owned by Qatar Gas where the size is up to 260,000 meters. Of course, they were seeking efficiency to reduce the unit cost, etc. But uh, it means that uh, more, uh, more large the vessel is, larger the vessel is, uh, it reduces less is the flexibility. So I mean that the normal size and probably the most efficient vessel is between 135,000 and 160. Of course, the origin of the first cargo was Algeria, which is by far the main source of the natural gas for Spain, even today, with more than 60% of the total gas being bought in Spain. And this first import wasn't exempted of difficulties. And I'm referring not only to, to, to the import operations, but also to, to the third party access contracting. Let me explain how, how it was, because it was really funny. 
And when we bought and we began uh, ASEPSA, this activity, uh, it wasn't planned. I remember that at this time I was working, the, uh, was doing uh, oil trading in, in Tepsa. And there was a, a manager of the natural gas activity, even if there was no activity in natural gas in Tepsa at this time, in 99 or 98, when he began. And I remember when I was doing uh, fuel oil trading, uh, this uh, general manager came to me and they proposed me, okay, go into Algeria. You want to come with me to Algeria to, to meet uh, natural gas people there? And of course, I, I tell him yes. It was a very tough uh, situation because really at this time, the security wasn't very good. I remember even when we, were, when we arrived to, to, to Algeria, uh, we accompanied by, by some people, etc. But it was really fascinating. We began to have meetings with Sonatra, that is a state company. I was telling them, okay, we, we have refineries, we have a CHP plant that is called Generations, we have chemical business, we are burning natural gas, we are a huge consumer, large consumer of uh, natural gas, and we want to buy gas from you. But after five, six meetings, Probably they thought that uh, we'll never commit ourselves uh, and we'll never buy a cargo for, from them. So they decided to offer us one vessel, just one vessel, this has a vessel, to so extremely good price if, that we couldn't uh, refuse. If we, we couldn't say no. At the end, we compared this price with the price we were paying at our refineries from Gas Natural. We're saving a lot of money. So the end, okay, we commit, we, we say them, yes, we'll buy you this, this car one. Afterwards, we went to NRS to sign a third party access contract for two months. We were just uh, wanted to have this, this, uh, this contract for two months. It was a time to, to consume the, the best sale that we had already bought from, from Sonatrack. But when we arrived to NRS, they told us, okay, I cannot sign two two months contract in the law. The minimum is two years. So I remember to feel the pressure at this time because it wasn't so easy to, to commit yourself for a two years contract to, to pay the the the, 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 the DPN fees when you haven't had secured your supply for this time. So at the end we decided to move forward. We so, okay, we don't have the gas, but we may have it in the future. And, uh, well, uh, this was the beginning of the of uh, TEPSA as a commercialization company. And we are here, at, as then you in my introduction, we are the fourth commercializer uh, in terms of market share. And probably, I'm, I'm sure that natural gas would be one of the key uh, businesses of SEPSA in the in the coming year. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, let's keep on reviewing the the history. Well, here in the slide, you could see that the first and import out of the monopoly. This is the, okay, this TV series. And let's move forward in the time. From these initial stages until today has happened many things. I can remember uh, those long meetings between all the stakeholders to define together the network code. The network code is las norm uh, so, uh, they are the normas de gestión técnica del sistema. You have there how the system is managed, uh, the responsibility of the different stakeholders, the procedures, how you have to program, to nominate, everything. And we, do, we did it together. I remember at these stages, at this time, that there was a lack of procedures, a lack of uh, IT 
we just used uh, Excel as a tool for invoicing. We we send uh, our uh, daily nominations, our program to to Inagas, uh, by mail, and we have very light organization. The commercial uh, department was the same, uh, was the same people uh, selling us to find our customers and to to programming, nominating, and, and even managing the the gas balance. But during these years, during these years, uh, these first years, the growth of the liberalized market was exponential. It was really huge with a double digits uh, annual growth. At this time, the pricing, the only thing that hasn't changed too much since this beginning was the pricing. Even this, from the beginning, we began selling to the customers with a brain formula, a brain cost formula, a cost plus formula. That means that since nearly all of us, all the suppliers, were importing our natural gas in the same way, brain price, a brain a price, at the end we add the TPA fees, we add the margin, and this was the formula that we were offering to our uh, Final customer. For us, it was a natural hedge. We wanted to avoid any risk. But since the market grew very quickly, at the end, soon it came uh, up the need to incorporate management system with more procedures and more control. We began to run our business under the network code that we developed as a nation with the other stakeholders instead of having any room that was as we began. Uh, we began uh, to, to uh, program and nominate all of our uh, the guys that we want to, 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 to send out from the regasification terminal, want to be withdrawn from the storage, uh, storage underground storage, etc. We, we, we began to nominate everything through a, an IT platform of NAGAS that is called Sistema SL APR. Instead of uh, sending just a line by, by mail. If we re refer to commercial issues, we were still selling our gas to, to our clients uh, at a formula cost plus. It's not really true. Uh, really, uh, at, uh, at this time, there was a reference, uh, there was a last, uh, there was a, um, a regulated tariff, and the regulated tariff was based on the what we call CMP. CMP really try to, to, to be a good benchmark of the long-term contract being imported in Spain. And at this time, at this, at this time, we had contracts that were priced against Brent, but some others, not many, but some others that were priced against gasoil, diesel, and fuel oil. So this CMP, this uh, regulated tariff was based in this CMP. And what we offer the client normally was a discount from this CMP. But do you know how that the basis risk between brain and gas oil or fuel oil is not huge, is not really big. So in principle, these prices are aligned. If the brain prices go down, gas oil and, and fuel oil uh, go down as well, as well and it go up. Uh, if the brain goes up, uh, fill oil and, and uh, fill oil uh, do the same. So the, the basis risk we uh, were bearing wasn't too much, and it's like if we were using brain uh, as reference. So uh, at this time, we had a change. The CMP disappeared, and all of us were saying to our customers, under brain formula, brain cost plus formula. 
that for us, as, as I mentioned, it was very good because for us it was a perfect hedging. We were pricing our gas in our sales in the same manner we were buying from our suppliers. But probably this is not this wasn't ideal for the for the client. We do still have this situation because at the end. What the, what the clients, what the customers was having is okay, commercial offers from, this, from different uh, retailers and some of them with different slopes. What they did, how, how, how they decide which one was the better because you, you always try to convince them that uh, our slope was a better because okay is a, is the is the better using the forward uh, prices of brain or is the better using the is the best using the the historical the historical values of brain etc. But at the end, the customers had to choose among those formulas based on the brain scenario they thought it was going to be the most likely. In this uh, in this year, I'm referring until 2008. You see, we have already analyzed from 1999. That was the first uh, the first uh, uh, cargo. I mean, here you, you could see not only the demand, the natural gas demand growth, but as well the portion of the market that was uh, liberalized. And in 2008, you could see how most of the market was liberalized. Only there was one small portion that is what we call the last uh, resort uh, customers. They have the right to have the last resort tariff that they could decide to stay in this regulated market and to, 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 to have a price that is the last resort tariff. tariff. Okay. Uh, okay. This is the situation. The growth uh, with the double digits, uh, about 10% uh, in, in annual basis. But there is another change. In 2008-2009, we began with this economic recession. We have seen an important demand fall between 2008 and 2015. Really, most of us, most of the suppliers in Spain, really, we booked ourselves under long-term commitment to buy natural gas with a forecast of growth that, okay, afterwards we haven't seen it from, from 2008 uh, onwards. So we have seen an excess of gas from this time. This led, this led to a very tough environment, a tough market, and we have seen a narrowing in the margins. Let me explain a bit, uh, let me enter in more detail because it is, it is, uh, it's important to understand what has happened this year, uh, during, this, uh, during, this, uh, during those years. Uh, well, let, let me give some figures as well. If, if you saw in the, in the previous slide, the total demand, let me open again. Well, uh, here there, there are not any figures, but in 2008, the total demand was 410, uh, 20, uh, well, 450 terawatt hour. If we compare with this year one, with two, 2015, we could hardly end this year with 310 terawatt hour. This means that we have seen a fall in the demand by nearly one third. And we have to find out the main reasons for such loss in the gas demand, not only in the economy. In fact, after a big drop in 2008 and 9, I mean, just at the beginning of the crisis, we have seen a smooth and a steady growth of the industrial demand, mainly driven by the refining sector. 
and the, it was uh, mainly driven by the refining sector as a consequence of the investment made by refining aiming to enhance their efficiency and conversion capacity. For example, a refinery in Huelva built up a hydrocracker to produce middle distillates, diesel and kerosene, to, be, to overcome the existing deficit in Spain on such products. These new units use natural gas as main fuel. Have to find this uh, part of this uh, this uh, drop in the demand due to the in the uncertain energy policy in Spain, mainly driven by political short-term interest. This has happened in Spain, but we have seen exactly the same in the rest of Europe. I referred in the first part of my presentation. We don't have a clear a clear long-term energy policy. Well, as I mentioned as well, the reason we don't know whether there'll be enough time to fix it or not is the progressive industry loss in Europe uh, due to the lack of competitiveness, of competitiveness with very high energy cost compared with our regions like, uh, like North America or Asia. Well, for me, it's important. I remember one book that I re recommend to all of you, uh, Stephen Covey, is uh, called The Seven Habits of the People Highly Effective. And one of the most important is to run your life, to behave always, always with the, with the end in your mind. You see, it's very important to know where you go or where you want to, where you want to go. You, and, and this can be applied not only to people, it can be applied to, to companies, enterprises, or even to countries. And this is what's been happening. But really, we haven't known where we wanted to go. For example, in Spain, after we, okay, we decided some, some 10 years ago that it was necessary to invest in combined cycles, uh, which, and, and, we build up and uh, more uh, the uh, I don't remember what well, the capacity is. I think more than 24,000 uh, megawatt hour of capacity, and uh, everybody was invested was investing in these uh, in combined cycles. The, the main uh, the largest uh, power companies they thought that they were going to run when they decided uh, this investment. They want to run these combined cycles more than 5,500 hours per year. And now the situation is that they run less than 1,000 hours per year. So, and what has happened? After having a great uh, help uh, subsidy and grants from the, from, the, from the Spanish administration, we moved and we switched from combined cycle to renewables. Some uh, years after, we decided that we should invest on renewables in wind farm, in photovoltaic, in solar thermal, and everybody began to 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 invest in, in these in these new renewables. And what is what is worse, we did it just at the beginning of the learning curve, because now the situation is different. If you invest in in eolic, at the end. Maybe you may have some IRR and you may have some profit on this investment because the cost of the technology has lowered very much. But when we decided to invest in eolic in wheat farm, at the end, it was just at the beginning of the learning curve. And at the end, we were paying the learning curve of the other countries, all, all, the, all, the, all the industry. And this has been one of the main uh, origins of the main reasons of the of the actual uh, deficit we see in the in the power in the power sector. Okay, let me review some other characteristics uh, of this uh, of this year. We are, I'm talking about 
from 2008 until, until now, until 2015, I've seen an excess of offer, a, a narrowing, a narrowing commercial margins, at least uh, during, the, during the first years, I mean, until the year 2011, 2012. Afterwards, we saw how the Asian prices uh, went up, and uh, we saw how the excess of gas we have here in Spain was diverted to, the, to this market where uh, the value of the, of the natural gas was, uh, was higher. But we, we have to compete in a very tight, in a very tough environment and with a great uh, competition. Uh, another characteristic, another characteristic is the increasing liquidity on the wholesale market. Spanish hub. True that we don't have an organized market. Uh, it's true that most of the physical trades until now have been uh, just pure logistical swaps with no price, but companies like us have been very active in the last two, three, four years in this wholesale market. We are continuously seeking arbitrage opportunities. We are always comparing, we are trying to arbitrate volumes from the, from the gas we import through the pipeline, the direct pipeline called Mesquimel gas. Uh, and, and we are continuously comparing this price with the price we can get here at the wholesale market, or the price uh, we can get if we import gas uh, through the Spanish uh, French, uh, French interconnection. Uh, well, uh, uh, the next year, 2016, for me, will be a, a key year as well, since from January we will have this organized market. Recently, we will see afterwards, it was approved a royal decree by the Ministry of, of Industry. And we are just uh, working on the on the market rules. Market. Another characteristic during this year is that uh, new holders with different risk profiles, especially uh, European energy traders with wholesale market. With uh, his uh, his goal, their goal was at the beginning the, the wholesale market, but ne nevertheless they have integrated themselves vertically. And some of them are actually aiming to sell gas to final customers, mainly large IRC. Well, really, I want to talk about too many things, but uh, I, I would like to talk, but I can't because I don't have enough time. Well, in this very well, increase of flexibility from gas infrastructures, uh, what we uh, have seen during this year that there was a, a fall in the, in the Spanish demand, the, the regasification terminals were less used. Uh, this means some problems because uh, you have uh, at the regasification terminal the boil, the, the boil of gas. Uh, if you don't have enough sent out and if you don't reach to the minimum technical. Uh, you may have some problem because if you don't have enough same time to, to, to sell this gas and to put this gas uh, into the transportation network, this boil, this boil of gas, you have to burn it. You have to send it to the torch, to the atmosphere, and to burn it. So, uh, in this sense, I have to say that NRS, uh, that is a very uh, customer oriented company, really they have invested uh, and made some, some investment. In order to, to, to have a higher flexibility and in order to give us a more flexibility, this bin that is very, very important to, to, to compete with some other markets. And in this very tough environment, we see different strategies for commercialization. As there, were some, there are some companies, or there were some companies more focused on short term, on the short term strategy, their priority was trading. They allocate their gas wherever they pay more for the gas. And we uh, shouldn't forget that in the last three years, from 2011 until 2014, the prices in Asia and South America were much higher in Spain. These companies really nearly abandoned the the, the Spanish gas market, they nearly left uh, this market and uh, they were just uh, pure traders. For them, the key factor 
is the opportunity cost of the electricity. Now the situation has changed because now the, the, the prices in Asia are the same as here in Spain uh, or in Europe. We have seen how, how uh, Europe is behaving as the last uh, resort market and is, is fixing the price for the LNG for next year, for example. And now, since they are low in gas, they are trying to come back to the Spanish gas market, but it's not so. It's a question of you should define what you uh, business model is, which is your business model, and uh, you need to, to have a strategy according to this. And there are some other companies that prioritize more the, what I call, long-term strategy, I mean long-term margins. Uh, these companies, uh, this is the Cepsas case, it's our case, we have decided to have an important base load of uh, clients, since we are a small company, we are a company we are just uh, 25 people, we are a wholesale, we are a wholesaler. We, sell, we are uh, selling us to large INC. INC is industrial and, and commercial customers, but with very large size, and we do trading. But the, the basis, we, we, our, our, our business model was based on having an important volume of uh, commercialization. It was based on commercializing gas to final customers. For example, CEPSA is selling more than 30,000 gigawatt hours per year. Based on this volume, we build up our business model. This volume gives give us the necessary flexibility, gives us the necessary capability to manage our gas balance in a very flexible way and to adapt our gas balance at any time to profit of those arbitrary opportunities that may arise. But the trading is a consequence of our commercialization. Of course, we will have to uh, we'll try to, 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 to get value from our business, but the basis for us is the commercialization. Well, uh, and now we are living the present, what's the present, and, and which is brief, since we are, this is why I put here present and future, because the present is so brief that we are just now already building the future. And once more, we are competing within the global economy. And we can't see Spain as an island, since Europe is focusing to develop a single European market, a wider commercial region, aiming to enhance our competitiveness and security of supply. Once more, and to be competitive with some other uh, areas. Once more, we need to adapt our strategy and organization to this new business paradigm. Let me spend some minutes talking about Europe, and Europe is, is working hard to perform those conditions needed to develop a European hub. It's important. The model is based on the gas target model. That, that means it consists on creating liquid hubs at each country and to invest in the necessary interconnection capacity to allow gas flowing between adjacent markets. The goal is the convergence of gas prices all around Europe and to have a unique gas price. National regulation authorities associated under uh, ACER and ZER define framework guidelines for those factors which are considered essential to allow the development of this market. First, capacity allocation mechanism, how to allocate the existing capacity. Second, congestion, congestion management procedure, how to manage if there is any congestion. Third, common imbalance rule. It's very important to, to, to run the business in the same way all uh, uh, around Europe. And the fourth one, that is, uh, we have advanced less than in the others because the others um, uh, have already done, uh, is the tariff and harmonization. Very important to have only one tariff all around Europe. Once these framework guidelines 
are defined that the first uh, three be already defined the TSO association I mean the, the technical system operators in Alas uh, in Spain uh, when in Portugal DRT gas in France exceptionally technical system operators association develops and propose network codes for each of these variables and mechanisms that afterwards I approved by comito by comitology by the different state members. And in all this process, it has been taken into account the opinion of the European wholesalers, retailers and traders. CERSA has been actively participating has actively participated in this process, anticipating changes, all of these changes, and adapting, and adapting its organization and talent matrix to this new way of business management. To gain competitiveness, we should adapt our cash balance management to fit price arbitrages between different hubs at European level. We cannot be any more Spanish company. To be a European camp, company, we want to be competitive. Otherwise, we'll be out of the market. But the process to achieve this European market, gas market, begins at each country. In Spain, as I mentioned, there was a royal decree that was approved uh, very recently. Uh, with, uh, with, uh, with all the conditions uh, that regulates uh, the, uh, this uh, organized uh, this uh, organized hub market in Spain, and in the next weeks we will have approved as well uh, by resolution of the energy secretary the market rules. Well, here uh, we have the time frame for the hub development in Spain. We, we see that uh, in May this year, it was included within the hydrocarbon law, this organized gas market. In November 2015, we have begun to accommodate the balancing rules in Spain to the European Network Code and the, to, to be able to implement all this network code by October 2016. In October uh, 2016, it's important, is we, we are obliged, we'll be obliged to, to implement the balancing network code uh, at European level. And for me, the key milestone is is in 2018, is to upgrade the interconnection per north, per sud. If we want to integrate, I'm talking about energy, with the rest of Europe, of course we need to invest in interconnection capacity between Spain and France. There is one project, a big, very important project that, that uh, trying to, to have this linkage uh, through, through Catalonia, that is called Midcap. But in principle, the bottleneck right now, we don't have within this interconnection. The bottleneck, the bottleneck right now, we have it in the, in the interconnection between the north and the south of France. And the final investment decision, in principle, that was taken by the French TSO, aims to, to, to have this upgrade in this capacity for 2018. I put in a question mark because we really do not believe that, uh, that they will arrive to, to, uh, in 2018 uh, to this uh, capacity expansion. Probably it's more, it's more likely in, in 2019. And the other question is that if Spain integrates uh, with uh, it, that itself with the rest of Europe, if we have enough interconnection capacity with Northwest Europe, 
doesn't mean that we will have a more liquid PVD price reference. And does this PVD price reference would become the reference in our price with the, with the final customer? This is what this is. This will become as a, the, the the price reference for the gas we pay uh, at our homes. Well, let me spend some minutes here because it's important. As I mentioned, uh, the gas target model that is uh, the principle, the scheme uh, in which the, the, the development of the, of the European single market is based. This, this, uh, this uh, gas target model is based on having hubs at country level. And afterwards, to have enough interconnection that could, uh, could allow prices at each country level to, to converge between among. But, there is, but I've already referred that actually there is a bottleneck on the interconnection capacity between Per North and Per Sur. Per, per North is the, uh, the French market is uh, split in, in three different uh, regions and Per North is the, is the, is the North. Uh, the FID for the increase 2019, we'll see what happens. But this is for sure the key milestone in order to have a liquid market here in Spain and in order to, to, to have more, competi more competition here in Spain because if there is a, an increase in this capacity, we'll see more companies and more, more trading, more traders uh, uh, coming to the, to the Spanish gas market. Well, under the current settings, really we could see in the short term a change in the, in the pricing scheme we have with our customers, with our clients. Definitely, no, I don't think so. Why? Because if you see, we are buying our gas mostly brain-based. Are we going to sell to our final customers PDB based if we don't have any way to hedge this risk? Really, probably not or not at least until 2018. Because in Spain, there is not any, um, in Spain, for example, there is not a liquid hub. We may have some liquidity to manage our gas balance in the day ahead and within day market. But for sure, there will be no liquidity if we talk about forward deliveries, future deliveries. If we don't have this future market, we cannot have the risk between PVB and rent. Is there any incentive for us to, to sell to our customers PVB related? I don't think so. You can tell me that uh, in Europe, it's true that the PDB is not liquid enough and we don't have a forward market, but we have a forward one, a forward market of MVP and TTF. Why not to use this MVP or TTF to hedge this risk? And the reason is that until not having enough interconnection capacity per north, per sud, we will see a very weak arbitrage between the Spanish gas prices, the PDD, and the MVP or TTF ones. Probably you can see in the graph I referred to some minutes ago to review when we were talking about the, the first part of my, of my presentation. If you see, there is a very volatile spread, MVP, PDD, or AOC in the same manner. With such a volatile spread, really, you cannot use MVP or TTF futures 
to hedge the risk between PVP and rates. Probably it's a bit complicated, but the, the main message is that I don't see any change in the pricing with clients, at least until not having enough interconnection capacity in France and until not having a proper convergence of prices between Spain and the rest of, of Europe. But and what may happen from, from 2018 once we have this interconnection capacity? Could we see PDD becoming a reference with our clients? Okay, maybe, maybe. At least we, we will have probably the PDD converging more to the to the MVP or TTF price. And if there is a reduction in this spread volatility, I mean between PVV and NDP, probably I could use NDP or TTF futures to hedge the risk between my main purchase contract, brain price, and a future PVV reference with, our, with my clients. But this is enough. Really, uh, uh, let's see what happens because it is true that there might be some, some other variables uh, whether the PDD would become the reference or not with, uh, with the clients. Uh, currently, there is a high market concentration on the Spanish market. And really, we don't know uh, whether the entry of new, new agents could be marginal or not. We have seen that there is a significant uncertainty of price drivers. Even we may have some moment when the prices in Spain do not arbitrate towards the European ones due to the specificity of the Spanish gas market that is more LNG driven than the rest of, the, of Europe. And one very clear message and that's it because it's one of the impacting messages that uh, we hear in the market is that the organized gas market needs a price reduction. This is not truth or not necessarily should be the case. Organized gas market does not mean price reduction. True or false? Let me very briefly recap some impacting messages that I've here I've heard in the in the market recently. Well somebody says that there is a, an already there is already a liquid gas hub in Spain. Well the answer is no. There are physical swaps with no market price involved. We are doing these physical swaps with third party trying to optimize our logistic cost, but it's just a pure swap, even there are not any cash flow involved. And there is not a market price for these transactions. Sometimes really the Spanish regulator and even in some European reports, you could see the volume and the size of the Spanish gas market. And they, these reports, they may include this volume. For me, these are not real trades. If you include these trades within the, the volume market, of course, you may see that Spain is a huge market, and this is not this is not a truth. In the last two, three, four years, sometimes we could do physical swaps of more than twice or three times the total volume we were selling to our final customers. Another message, the commercialization companies do not want price transparency. No, it's not true. Not, at least not all of them. TEPSA supports a liquid market that ensures transparency, but more importantly, reduces our price risk. Let me remind you one situation that we lived three years ago. We were very unlucky, and unlucky, and uh, this is the normal, this is not a normal situation. But when you import LNG cargos and from countries like Nigeria, even Norway, with uh, some technological issues, there might be some events of force majeure. 
when there is a, a, even an event of force majeure, then you are not supplying with this uh, with this carbon. Uh, it's true that uh, this situation is very unlikely, but we live three times in only one year. What should we have to do? What have we do uh, at this occasion? Of course, you need to find out a, re a substitution gas. Have to replace this gas because you can't stop the supply to your your customers. They are firm. You cannot uh, close. You cannot disrupt. The, the, the supply to one industry that uses the natural gas for uh, ceramic production, for example, because the, 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 the consequence losses and the consequence damages could be very, very important. Well, we were very unlucky, unlucky, unlucky. We, we have three times this situation. We were cancelled by three cargos in only one year. That is too much. And we have to go to to this to, to the Spanish hub to the wholesale market to to find out the gas to replace such such volume. Since there wasn't a transparent price, since there was a a, a liquid market, and we, at the end the prices at this market were very much affected and are very much affected by any disruption in one of the main origins of the gas. And when the price was 30 euros per megawatt hour, we had to pay even 45 euros per megawatt hour to get this gas. If we have a liquid market, transparent price, more competitors, more gas over there at this market, this will reduce our price risk should there be any disruption in the supply. Excessive margins. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, it's not true. Uh, really, I don't know uh, where uh, this message, uh, message is coming is coming from. Really, mm, uh, the last year commercial in the last years, yeah, and I'm talking about the last four, five, six years, the commercial margins hardly allow, allow uh, hardly allowed break even. You know that how we price our gas to the customer. It's a brain cost plus formula. Cost of gas, TPA fees plus our margin. Well, these margins, in most of the cases, could hardly allow the, the break even prices. And you, you can say, then why company like CEPSA uh, is uh, or has, has its business model based on commercial margins that are are going to break even simply because this gives us enough volume to manage our gas, our gas balance in a very flexible way, and to 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 play uh, arbitrages and to 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 have margin from our trading. This is the way in which we work. This is, and this is a, a, our business model. But this is important. Even this trader, even this trading, this trading is a consequence of selling gas to uh, eligible customers, to industrial uh, customers in Spain with a total volume of more than 30,000 gigawatt hours. Well, let me remind you yeah, as a conclusion. Let me sum summarize the main messages uh, using uh, once more the, the image of the Erase una vez el hombre. Uh, and we have seen the evolution of the natural gas commercialization company. I mean, its life cycle. How commercialization was born more than 15 years ago? 16, really? The huge demand growth in the first years, above 10% per, per year per annum, and there were few procedures, control, and systems. Great expansion of a liberalized market. This makes necessary management system and more control and procedures. Tough competition since 2008, 
due to the fall in the demand area in Spain or Europe. The success, the success key was to find out the optimal equilibrium between control and service and flexibility for customers. We shouldn't forget if we have a business model based telling us to find our customers, that these customers are the key for us and we have to provide them good service, but always with an equilibrium. Well, and, and in a stagnated market, as, as we are living now, we are competing now, both in Spain and Europe, the commercialization companies, and I'm talking now about future, must avoid getting older. And we should do it through the innovation of our business model. It is important, it is very important to do it from now, just once we detect the first symptoms. It is really important to be very proactive and to be the first. To conquer new markets, new technologies, and new countries has become essential. This is what we are doing, trying to expand our activities to, 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 to France, to, to Portugal, to some other European markets. And always remember how important it is to have a long-term mindset and very clear goals. Remember Stephen Covey, we should always work with the end in our minds. Remember that long-term mindset wins. Short-term players normally lose. You may gain, you may win, you may earn money during some uh, years, but some others you will lose. And let me finish as well. Talking about the main messages of, of our, our company, let me read them. Uh, we are probably, you have followed what uh, CEPSA, CEPSA is. CEPSA until 2011 was a company shared by, by Total, the French company, and by IPIC, it's a Royal Investment Fund of Abu Dhabi. Of Abu Dhabi. Each of them 46, 47, and uh, with only a small part, 5% floating in the stock market. In mid 2011, we had a big change that has been very important for us. It was the took over, the taking over by IPIC of total participation. Now, CEPSA is a company fully owned by IPIC. And this has changed completely our strategy. Now, until then, we were just a pure refining company in Spain. Now, we have a more international strategy. We have invested a lot in the last two, three years. We have bought some exploration and production assets. And it's our intention to, to grow in this market and to become a, a global a company and in the in the energy business this is our intention and this is what uh, we are aiming international focus continuous improvement efficiency and responsibility are the three pillars on which we base everything we do with a strong international focus and utmost respect for the environment. For example, the last year we invest more than 3 million, uh, 3,000 million euros to buy Coastal, a Canadian company with assets in Thailand and Malaysia, offshore assets, that means that there are great synergies with our traditional business, because EPSA exploration and production was more uh, onshore. And we bought as well recently a one alcohol company that consolidate us as the first raw material producer for detergent in the world. We invest as well in one petrochemical plant in, in Shanghai, in China, to produce phenol, phenol resins. 
that is to, to manufacture plastics for the for the cars and it's true that probably the demand has gone a bit down in the in the last year but the Chinese market is a market with a huge uh, potential so you see that we have become from a, a national player to an international player and this have come uh, with, uh, with IP with our uh, new owner. Sustainable energy. Our main priorities are to supply society with safe, reliable and sustainable energy and to contribute to the economic and social development of the communities where we operate. We will try to give any client with the best solution for him that makes his life easier. And the natural gas definitely will be an important pillar of, of our company in the future. Mentioned in my introduction, companies like Shell, Total, and BP, but FEPSA uh, will have as well natural gas. We, just, we already have it. Innovative spirit are uh, seen to, to face with these new settings, this new uncertainty, it's important not only to have innovation in products, it's very important to have innovation in your business model, to analyze continuously your business model and how you, and what you need and how to get it to get to be more resilient and to face better with the uncertainties that we have to face with in the in the, the next years. Customer satisfaction, of course, uh, for TEPSA is a priority, and for a company like like ours, that is a commercial company, uh, our commitment to qualifying our products and services and to customer cost, consumer satisfaction is the cornerstone of our relationship uh, with our customers. CEPSA is focusing on new markets and new technologies. CEPSA, I can say, I can tell you that uh, CEPSA is among the five largest players in the world in supply, to, in, 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 in bankers. Bankers is the fuel for vessels. And CEPSA is among the five, the five, uh, among the five largest ones in the whole world, and in supplying fuel oil and diesel. We have natural gas as well, and we are working very hard in developing this market. It's a market with a huge potential and should be important if we want to have a sustainable development in the future. This is very important. My colleague eh, Juan Carvalho, that is, eh, is with me. He is the responsible um, the, uh, and the uh, okay there is one uh, there is one I miss one one slide but uh, uh, maybe um, I will give uh, the people of the University of Polytechnic in Madrid or is just to give you thank you but as well to to um, to give you my contact details should you need any any inquiry, any 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 question to, to ask me. Uh, I'm uh, Antonio Americon Alvarez, uh, and as I said, I'm the general manager of uh, Fepsas Comercializadora. The next session it will be uh, given by Juan Carvalho. He is the uh, responsible, the director of the uh, of market development and risk, and he will talk. Uh, specifically about these LNG bankers that for, for uh, us is really a very important market and it is our intention and we are aiming to offer uh, the ship owners and uh, these customers a very diversified uh, portfolio of products and of course the LNG should be an important one. I, as in, I don't know if we have any question. Okay. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for your uh, attendance. And uh, okay.
if you have any question, I will uh, give my presentation with my contact details and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.